This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free. Tonight on Keys to the PUA, Dirty Dog Noah takes on FD Signifier, aka The Professor, in a three round contest at Dance Cave. Each round is a challenge carefully designed to test the video essayist's ability to seduce women in a real life battlefield. Now let's take a closer look at tonight's players. Up first, Dirty Dog Noah. What up y'all, I'm Noah, AKA the Dirty Dog, and you're in the dog pound. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <sighs> you know, I've always said the quickest way into a woman's heart and pants is in, if you get into her mind first. That's why I read a lot of books. I have all these books here that I, def I read. I got something for the anarchist girls, for the Marxist-Leninist girls, for the, you know, just dipping their toe in that socialism, girls. You know what it is. Barack Obama famously said, if you want to get some, if you want better luck with the ladies, better read some Karl Marx. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's working out. And it helps me pick up girls and also learn about material reality and uh, the sort of economic conditions of the modern world. I highly recommend this All About Love by Bell Hooks. Keep it on your desk or on your nightstand up in front. You don't have to read it. Just keep it in view and keep it, make sure people think that you are pursuing healthy avenues for what love is because, hey, do what you gotta do. You know what I'm saying? The quickest way to get into a woman's heart is through her stomach. Turns out there's multiple ways to get into a woman's heart. So I cook mostly simple, practical meals, you know, always keep ingredients in the fridge, but I'm gonna make sure you're fed, I'm fed, carved up, ready for whatever goes down after that. Although cooking is, of course, traditionally a biologically feminine trait, I, it doesn't stop me from indulging a little bit, doing some girl boss type stuff. I'm a little bit of a gamer. It's helpful, you know, get your mind right before going out at night, catch a couple dubs, get your fingers warmed up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> For sex. See, the bedroom is where the magic happens, right? But specifically, the bed within the bedroom is where the magical magic happens. If you know what I'm saying, you can tell I get busy with it because my bed won't even stay made, no matter how hard I try. It, it knows, it knows what I'm up to in there. The amount of times I've had sex is over, it has to be, you can't even count. The amount of times I put myself inside of, an, of a woman it has to be over the amount of times that I could count on my hands. Personal hygiene's important to me, you know, but it's nowhere near as important as just being able to be smelled from across the club. Usually when I walk in, at least two people faint. I think if you're going for a night out and you don't end up knocking people out through smells or fists, then you're, you're that's a big L for you. What do you say? Throw me a bone, ha <laughs> ha. And now, FD Signifier, AKA The Professor. See, the young guys don't have anything on an old playboy like myself because they don't know the appropriate lines to say to a nice lady to get the, you know, the juices flowing. Watch this. Remember when 9-11 happened, but you were a full grown adult that was able to vote? Remember the first Power Rangers show, but you were in middle school? Remember when McDonald's had styrofoam packaging? Remember when Reagan was president when we were kids? Remember the Cold War? Remember when Dennis Miller was Bill Maher? Remember the beginning of global warming though? Oh, are you leaving? Well, you wanna get my number? Do you have like a, one of those, those new mobile phones, like the flip phones, like the Razor? See, here's the thing. All the young guys think they're hot shit till they come up against, you know, a gentleman with seasoning. I don't think my age is in any way a disadvantage. In fact, it's a complete advantage. And I'll show you. Well, this is all my kids stuff. Don't worry about that. What I'm trying to show you is. So I know Noah's like, you know, a young, hot guy and all that. But he's no match for the professor. This is going to be really easy. Noah, I'm going to teach you a lesson in love. Whatever. Yeah. I've been informed that FD Signifier will not be competing in tonight's games. He said that 10pm on a Thursday is too late for him and he needs to drive his kids to school the next day. The winner, by default, is Dirty Dog Noah. Number one, number one, that's me. 
Hey everyone. In this video, I'm going to be talking about reality shows about pickup artists. Right after picking up the bag and telling you about this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Folks, if you're anything like me, then on the night of June 24th, you were visited by three ghosts who taught you the true meaning of anti-Christmas and have since given up your life of kind-hearted philanthropy to become a cruel, penny-pinching eugenicist. But you're still not sure if you're as cheap or as evil as you could be. That's where Surfshark comes in. With Surfshark, you can connect to the internet from anywhere in the world, allowing you to access region-locked content on streaming services like Netflix, thus spitting in the faces of the good, hard-working copyright lawyers who region-locked it in the first place. The VPNs can actually save you money in a lot of neat ways. For example, hotel prices will change depending on where you book from, charging people in other countries more than they do locals, as they should in order to provide maximum maximum return for their shareholders in a free market. But with Surfshark, you can be evil and change your location to get a better deal while effectively taking food out of the mouths of the kind, hard-working board members over at ITT Inc., the conglomerate that now owns Caesars Palace. And evilest of all, you can betray Surfshark. For a limited time, if you click the link in the description, go to surfshark.deal slash we're in hell, or use the promo code we're in hell at checkout, all one word, no apostrophe, you'll get Surfshark for 83% off for two years, plus an additional three months for free, while supporting this channel a little bit while you're at it. So, as you've probably noticed, there's been a lot of discussions lately about men's rights activists, pickup artists, red pill ideology, and the manosphere as a whole. So, for this video, I decided to give my own take on it. Contrary to popular belief, misogyny wasn't created by Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, or the Fresh and Fit podcast, but actually dates back at least as far as the mid-2000s. Pickup artistry and the seduction community as a whole surged in popularity in 2005 with the release of Neil Strauss's The Game, which brought what was once an extremely niche and secretive subculture into the mainstream, and along with other things, led to the creation of some truly terrible reality TV. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The first show I'm going to be going over is one called Keys to the VIP, which is one of those shows that you've either never heard of or I just unlocked an unbelievably deep memory for you. Or you've seen Curtis Conner or Cody Ko's videos on it. <laughs> By the way, I like how as I get more tattoos and Curtis gets worse facial hair, I'm moving away from looking like Big Joel's younger brother and towards looking like Curtis Conner after a messy divorce. For the uninitiated, Keys to the VIP was a very Canadian reality show, by which I mean unhinged in a way that only taxpayer-subsidized TV can be. This may be a bit of a hot take, but the government paying for the culture industry can be a bit of a mixed bag. While it did give us David Cronenberg, we also got a show where a guy hunts humans and a children's game show featuring a man in full-blown bondage gear. But there are also negatives, like Keys to the VIP, a show where horrible men compete to see who's the best pickup artist. The way the show works is that each episode has two contestants who are introduced through a video they shoot explaining why they're the ultimate pickup artist, and they're always hilarious. First of all, almost all of them are shot in what is very clearly their parents' basement. <laughs> you can tell because there's always these little details like, no basement apartment has fancy brass knobs on all of the cupboards. These intros all fall into two categories. 
Unbelievable Cringe or The Worst Men Alive? My name is John, and this is my Playland. In Playland, this is my bedroom. This is where the ladies come over, I spin some tracks, and then we get down to business. Woo! Guys, if you want to be a real player like me, you got to get a pimped out condo like this. I call it the palace. I got barbecues, I got jacuzzis. I don't like to take girls home. I have secluded park that I usually bring them for the first few times. It's the greatest place to go. Part of my pimping project is going to be the bar here. My name is Patrick, I'm 21. At one point I dyed my hair, it's crazy. This is where I'm going to have my little futon bed where I'm going to be able to lay some lumber. Over here, we're going to be having a, a go-go cage for all the ladies. So they can come here and they can rip it up. Yeah. What I like to do is I like to spray it in the high traffic areas. Application is the key to penetration. What's up everybody? My name is Donnie and welcome to my bar. In any given environment, girls are attracted to the alpha male. If you own a bar, then just by virtue of that alone, you are the alpha male in that environment. I live to talk to women. I live to hit on women. And that's what I'm all about. She's just another girl that looks like without all that makeup. Damn, I'm sexy. When I play the game, I never strike out. There's also a bunch of guys who will just lie about things in ways that are very clearly visible to the naked eye. Like, this dude who says that he has a massive bed while just showing what is clearly a double. A nice comfortable couch, you can get cuddly, you can get close with one or two or however many ladies you'd like. This is the bed, nice and spacious, you can fit as many people on here as you'd like. Wait, no shade, I have a bed that size and I guess you can technically fit as many people as you want, provided that you want to fit barely two. Also, by far the cringiest contestants are the ones in episode four, Cocoa Butter Chris and Yakov the Trapper. By the way, everyone on the show has some kind of weird nickname like that. While I doubt that this was normal, this show did come out when I was like 12, so since I really don't know, I'm choosing to believe that everyone who fucked in 2006 had a sex alias. Like, you lose your virginity and the first thing you see hanging on a wall or lying on the bedside table becomes your title. They call me Sam aka Pulp Fiction Poster, aka Dirty Dishes, aka Well-Used Bottle of Jergens. So first up, we have Cocoa Butter Chris. Before I go out, I like to use Cocoa Butter. I put it on everywhere. Even coat on my skin, gives me a good shine, keeps it healthy and rich, and the ladies love it. Smells good, and I've even heard tastes good. Chris rules because he's the cockiest guy ever while also being unbelievably uncomfortable in his own skin. I call myself the architect. I started the trend. I designed the game. Tonight, I'm winning. I'm taking that title and I'm taking the ladies home because I'm smiling and I'm fly. I'm what the ladies like. Also, saying that you're smiling while very clearly not smiling is such a weird and hilarious thing to do. <laughs> Just having a completely straight face and being like, I'm grinning ear to ear right now. Although, to be fair, he is about to go to the club, so maybe that's him just practicing his gaslighting while he gets ready. Yeah, girl, I'm smiling right now. Also, all your friends are crazy. Don't listen to anything they say. When Chris is in the club, it's honestly one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. Yeah, so how about we dance all together? Yeah, not for a little bit? All right, ladies, you guys take care. How's it going? Good. How's it going? It's great. Good. What's your name? Not need to know. Yeah, not need to know. And why is that? Because I'm talking to people. All right. Sorry, but I'm just going to say it. He's not smiling or fly. And then going up against Chris is Yakov. Hey, I'm Yakov. This is my pad. Everything here reflects what I do, why I do it. I'm a hunter. Why not? But I'm also kind of a little bit of a trapper. Yeah, you know what I mean? Who doesn't love a cowboy? This is the bed. It's got three positions, because there's obviously more than one type of girl. It's the hunt. You know, in prehistoric civilization, there was just killing animals and, you know, the women. Now we don't have the killing animals. I'm not just saying this because he's kind of small, but I don't think that he's actually old enough to get into the club. Like, everything in Yakov's room feels like the kind of thing a 12-year-old would think makes you a cool adult.
Also, I like when he says that his bed has three positions because there's more than one type of girl. Like, for sure, that's why you sleep on a futon, because you're such a generous lover. One of the really funny things with Yakov is how at one point he's dancing and trying to talk to a girl and the judges notice someone looking at him and they're like, why is it that guys like to pick on Yakov? Why are they so insecure? Uh, I think we're back in high school. Let me tell you something. This, let me tell you something about this guy here in the pink shirt. He shouldn't be picking on anyone. I'm like, that guy's not picking on him. He's very obviously trying to buy Molly. Speaking of the judges, they get introduced at the beginning of each episode and... Oh man. Our expert panel of pickup commentators with perspectives descending from the four corners of the male psyche. All I'm saying is that living in your mother's basement is nowhere near as embarrassing as being introduced like that. There's Alan, the cold, calculated master of pickup analysis, Peaches, an ex all star jock inspired seduction specialist, Sheldon, the mysteriously coy and unorthodox philosopher, and Chris, a hopelessly romantic man of integrity. Ah, yes, the four corners of the male psyche. We got jock, soft boy, soft boy, and dark triad. All these guys are absolute freaks. Also, a funny thing I found when I was researching this video is that a lot of the contestants were struggling actors, and so when I went to the IMDb page for the show looking for information on the judges, it's hard to find them because so many of the contestants have gone on to have much more successful careers than them. So like, well, I'm not really sure about him being a philosopher. When the intro describes Sheldon as mysteriously coy, I guess that actually makes sense, since I literally couldn't even find his last name online. On the show, Sheldon doesn't really give as much commentary as the other judges. His big thing, though, is that he really likes it any time a guy lies to a woman. I'll say I like the fact that he's willing to do something to, to meet a woman. He says he'll, you know, lie a little bit or do whatever. Hey, this is where his acting skills are. I was just are, about are, to say that. Definitely coming into play. <laughs> this is in his wheelhouse, yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. He's a professional liar, basically. You can tell a woman anything if you do it right. And all you gotta do is either surround the truth with lies or the lies with truth. <laughs> like, genuinely one of the most fucked up things I've ever seen. Just imagine your main interest being watching men be dishonest. Next up is Peaches, who really leans into the whole jock thing. He gets really hyped up whenever a contestant says that he's an athlete. That guy is a winner. Did you see the trophies in the background? He is a winner. That's the indication of a winner. No, he's already made a positive impression on me. He's an athlete, number one. <laughs> and number two, uh, well, athletes bring a certain thing to game. And it's the, the, the skill level, the tactician, the attention, the small detail. He's a big man with a deep voice. And these are, you know, two classic characteristics of what women want to see in a man. You know, it's quite clear to see that he's an alpha male. Alpha male athlete, player, winner. Also, he constantly drops these unbelievably specific sports analogies. You know, uh, I, I liken his performance to Wayne Gretzky in Game 2 in the 87 Canada Cup against the Soviet Union. The guy was just possessed. He was in his own. He left his focus and he moved on to the friends. He gets a little opening and like a running back, he hesitates and before you know it, it closes. You know, there's defensive linemen all over the place. Yeah, yeah exactly. He's got to hit that hole hard. hard. Son of Paisan. Son of... Oh, wow. <laughs> This is a Rembrandt. I love this kid. You know what it is? Indicative of Michael Jordan going into the playoffs. No one talks like that, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? But also, out of all the judges, Peaches is for sure the one who's most into pickup artist culture. Like, you can tell from some of the terminology he uses on the show that he was an active member on some of the worst message boards on the internet. Something I noticed here, did you see her lean in? Yes. In the seduction community, it's called pecking. Yeah. And whenever somebody pecks like this and comes forward, it's them saying, I'm very, very interested in what you have to yeah. say. He, he talked about what he could do to improve her. Improve yes. her. Yes. So therefore, she's like, really? And starts qualifying herself to him. As a neuro-linguistic programmer, this is fantastic. Cerebral implantation, telling them that he's coming back, telling them what he's gonna do when he comes back. It really is a, a Picasso in terms of uh, the, the mental approach. Next is Alan. He's basically their leader, and considering that his intro is just like, yeah, this guy's a sociopath, it's probably not a surprise that he is one of the biggest scumbags I've ever seen. He really likes it whenever contestants lie or insult women. To be honest, Pathetic. You just made a huge fool of yourself. Pathetic? Maybe you should uh, get your nails done, your toenails done. It's called a pedicure. Take care. <laughs> hey, look at her mouth right now. Look how her mouth is. Because she's thinking to herself, yeah, I do need a pedicure. Did it take you long to do your hair and makeup? Um, my makeup probably took me about a half an hour. I did it myself. 
my hair, I work at a salon, so I had a stylist that did. She's always dreaming about being that Gwen Stefani interview because it was her moment, right? Well, my stylist did my hair. I didn't make it myself for half an hour. I'll give you five minutes if you can, if you can make her yours. I need, I need two. Wow. <laughs> Wow. What I love about her is he's talking about her like she's not even there! Also, in one episode, there's a contestant whose gimmick is that he acts like a nice guy, and it's so fucking gross. Nothing gets the girls better than when I bring them home and I take them to my piano and sing them a song. You're out there somewhere, but I don't know. See, I play the whole nice guy thing. That works a lot better. This is the game that we're born to play. From the beginning of time, men have chased women. It's what we do. Alan fucking hates this guy, but not because he's like pretending to be nice in order to manipulate women, but because pretending to respect women is too close to actually respecting them for Alan's liking. He can't offer a woman what she needs, which is a dominant force in the bedroom. <laughs> Straight up! These I girls know. are going on a date with him on Thursday to get a free meal and a free ticket to the CNE. <laughs> You're dated. Not at all! <laughs> Not at all! And yeah. when the first bump in the road comes, they're calling me. Oh, you're just pretending to respect women? Sorry, bro. But satire requires a clarity of purpose and target, lest it be mistaken for and contribute to that which it intends to criticize. Speaking of nice guys, Alan's big rival on the show is Chris, the hopelessly romantic man of integrity. Chris is kind of the punching bag on the show. Uh, Chris, where would you go with this besides uh, ho home to read a, a poem to them? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, he was gonna read a poem. <laughs> yeah, get his ass. The thing with Chris is that he's kind of just there to complain about how guys should be nice. Like, he is, I guess, the least bad judge on the show, but that's a pretty fucking low bar. He's extremely concerned with contestants being gentlemen, but what he means by that is pretty unclear. There's an episode where one of the contestants mentions offhand that he wears cologne and moisturizes. This is more of a summer cologne. It's a um, Caribbean tonic or Bermuda tonic, as they say. Last but not least, I've got my uh, lotion. And Chris is like, ah yes, a fellow gentleman. He obviously pays attention to the finer details, you know, the clones, the, the cream, and uh, being articulate. So far, he looks like a gentleman, and I like him for that already. In one episode, a woman is at the club with her boyfriend, and much more importantly, very clearly doesn't want to talk to the contestant. What's your plan for tonight? What are you doing? Yeah, that's it? Yeah. You're gonna go home with him? You're gonna do that kind of thing? Yeah. What well, we got in potential. Yeah. Try these on. Yeah. No, 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 I'm getting good. You sure no, about no, that? No, no, no. You sure no, about no, that? No, no, no. I'm not gonna get in trouble, am I? Yeah. Okay, sorry. And Chris's takeaway from that pretty fucked up interaction is this. Personally, I, I actually really like the way you handled the big dumb oaf. There could have been a million wrong ways to handle that. He handled it perfectly. And that shows a lot of promise, and I like Ryan. Hey, sometimes guys will make women feel unsafe and uncomfortable, but as a gentleman, the best way to handle that situation is to be wearing cologne. The only really consistent line in the sand I've noticed for Chris is that he really doesn't like it when a guy lies. My name is Kareem. I'm one of the managers here at the club. What do you say? I'm one of the managers here? I'm one of the managers here, which is great. Yeah. Social value. Straight up lie. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, to be fair, that makes him better than any of the other judges and is a very normal thing to hate, except if you hate it so much, you probably shouldn't be on a show where you make men compete to see who's best at lying to women. Just doesn't seem like a good fit. Which brings us to the challenges. In each round, the contestants have to complete a challenge the show gives them. First of all, the challenges range in complexity in a pretty wild way. For example, some are like weirdly basic social interactions. In round one, each player has three minutes to make a woman laugh. Let's see how our players perform under pressure. Round one, each player has five minutes to introduce himself to three different women. Others just have the contestants do something insane. 
In this round, each player must obtain a woman's phone number, but may only speak in questions. In round one, each player has three minutes to obtain a woman's phone number, but may never stop dancing. In this round, each player must seduce a woman onto the dance floor without saying a single word. In round three, each player must ask a woman to abruptly stand silent during a pickup while listening to a song that reminds him of his grandmother. And listen, with these... I don't like that they have to involve women who are just trying to enjoy their nights, but I think that if you're watching this video, we should all be able to agree that making shitty guys humiliate themselves on TV is something that we can all enjoy. But most of the challenges are way grosser. A bunch of them involve getting a girl's number after insulting her. In this round, each player must retrieve a woman's phone number. But the conversation must be initiated by insulting her hair and makeup. In this round, each player must initiate a pickup by insulting a woman's dress or shoes. In this round, each player has five minutes to retrieve a woman's phone number. But the conversation must be initiated by insulting her shoes. The way the judges talk about this is so gross, too. In one episode, a guy insults a girl's shoes, but then tries to recover by saying that her eyes are beautiful. I really don't like your shoes. And I don't like that purse. However, however, I think you have very beautiful eyes. I know that's wrong with my shoes my purse. And all the judges laugh and make fun of her for being too vain and shallow to appreciate the very nice and good compliment that he just gave her. <laughs> he forgets about the compliment she just yeah. received. Don't worry about my natural beauty. Let's talk about these shoes that I bought on sale for $10. But also leaves her with hope. Ditch the shoes in the purse and maybe you can do <laughs> First of all, that's just how anyone would react to that because it doesn't matter if it's followed by a compliment, walking up to someone you don't know and immediately insulting them is an unbelievably weird and off-putting thing to do. Also, there's the way that they act like complimenting her natural beauty is so much better, but the thing is, she picked those shoes. Most people don't choose what their eyes look like. Just a little pointer for the fellas watching, and also anyone really, if you're just meeting someone it can come off as creepy if you compliment them on something that they have no control over. Things like clothing, hair, and makeup, on the other hand, can actually be great things to compliment because those are things that they actually put thought and effort into. And then there are the challenges where they just get the guys to do something which is straight up predatory or toxic. Round one, each player has three minutes to get a woman's phone number. But the player may only talk about himself and can never let the woman speak. In this round, each player must make a woman laugh at her friends. In round three, each player must separate a woman from her group of friends. Separation is the key to seduction. Fully just gamifying toxicity. Also, with the talking over a woman one, it's funny, one of the contestants does like really, really well. Can I tell you something? I get in a taxi cab. I get in this taxi cab, this cab breaks down. Can you believe that? Anyways, it breaks down, this guy asks me to push his cab away from traffic. It just it doesn't matter, it just, I really don't want to stay here anymore, you know what I mean? But honestly, I don't want to leave without your number. I want to call you up, I want to take you out for dinner, you know, schmooze a little bit, get to know you, because you seem like a really beautiful person, and I bet you're even more beautiful inside. But then, in all the other rounds, you see that that's actually just how he normally talks to women. Think about it, you know, you're going on a date, you're, you're, you're hanging out with this guy, all of a sudden, everything is working, everything. And then the final category is, of course, get a girl's number after telling her an extremely obvious lie. In round one, each player must initiate a pickup by fishing for a compliment about his recent plastic surgery. In this round, each player must obtain a woman's phone number while pretending they share the exact same occupation. In round one, each player must obtain a woman's phone number while speaking in a fake accent. Hopefully this will be the only thing being faked tonight, fellas. Every time they do one of these challenges, nice guy Chris will say something about how he doesn't like that they lied. He's being saying, I'll make a deal with you. He's being deceptive. Based on the game, he's successful. I should have one question to ask. What's he going to do when she realizes that he's not Russian? <laughs> Figure that out later. Figure that out later. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, man, you should stop making them do that. So a few observations about Keys to the VIP. 
One thing is that throughout the show, there are a bunch of times when the dude will hit on girls who are way too drunk, and the judges do not have any problem with this. I'm all right. Yeah? <laughs> Amazing, honestly. <laughs> You're a good guy. I'm a good guy? You're a great girl. I think this is just a buffet. Another thing that's really interesting is how the show gamifies social interactions, something that's very typical of pickup culture as a whole. We can see that very obviously with Peach's weird sports analogies, but also with the way that the show is very intentionally presented. There are all these points where something will happen and they'll do an instant replay while drawing lines on the footage to imitate sports commentators. You know what? He went right through the lead blocker there yeah, to get to yeah, the quarterback. He, he, yeah, he did. Did you go to the beach a lot? Do you see that? Oh, I see her that. turn her back to the guy she was standing with. <laughs> <laughs> that box up she did yeah. would put her on any NBA roster. I promise. Right over here. Get your number. Yeah. Great position. Great. Box out to, yeah. uh, to a pivot. Likewise, the judges are all sitting back watching all of this on a TV at a bar like a bunch of armchair quarterbacks. Which, also, I get that the bar was obviously closed when they filmed this, but that is such a weird conceit, right? Like, imagine being at a trendy bar and over in the corner are four dudes sitting around a TV watching hidden camera footage of men harassing women. But, and I know this is going to seem like kind of a stretch, but this gamification is all in line with the way that pickup artists view the process of seducing women, or as they call it, game. The metaphor of seduction as a game, while pretty broadly accepted in general society, is heavily pushed by pickup artists who view interacting with women as having specific rules, dominant strategies, and winners and losers. A common PUA slogan is, attraction isn't a choice. As Ran Almog and Danny Kaplan put it in their article, the nerd and his discontent, the seduction community and the logic of the game as a geeky solution to the challenges of young masculinity. Jesus, I feel like this article title just shoved me in a locker for playing D&D. Anyway, the article says, the justification of the community gurus for advocating a kind of social conduct and discourse that otherwise would be unacceptable relies on a framing of the pickup interaction as a game. This metaphor is particularly useful for this purpose because of the evasive, dual association both with rational behavior, as in game theory, and with the suspense of everyday rationality. In his book Homo Ludens, the Dutch historian Johan Hisinga describes games as standing outside of normal life in a designated time and space in which normal societal rules are suspended and replaced with different ones. Through conceptualizing social interactions as a game governed by objective rules and free from the bounds of normal human interactions, Almog and Kaplan argue that for pickup artists, Courtship is constructed as a standardized, rule-governed social skill and is characterized by hyper-consumerism and objectification of women. The strict reliance on gaming logic culminates in the dehumanization of all parties and suspends moral considerations. One example of how this plays out is that the judges really can't seem to wrap their heads around the idea that women might actually like sex. What I mean by this is that there are a bunch of times in the show where the woman is extremely obviously the one who's pursuing the guy, and for a bunch of seduction specialists, they really don't seem to notice at all. For instance, in the first episode, one of the contestants is just this big, hot dude, and so for one round, there's a girl who's down unbelievably bad. Would you paint somebody like a nude photo? First of all, in that interaction, there's one part where the judges all clap for him because he remembered the girl he was talking to's name. I like your style, Dana. I, don't know. I like the way you put together. Oh, you remembered my name? Yes, I did. Well done. Uh, yeah. well done. Yeah. Just love imagining these guys cheering like that anytime a guy isn't the absolute worst. Like, he forgot his girlfriend's birthday but bought flowers from the gas station on his way over. A toast! Anyways, this girl Becky is extremely openly into this guy, and the judges keep analyzing it in such a weird way. 
Do you remember my name? Becky. This one, this one, Becky, the validator. She she needs to be validated, eh? <laughs> she's uh, she's what you'd call the focus puller in the group. You think so? Yeah, I call those That's the focus puller. That's your technical puller. term? That is my technical <laughs> term. I like to call her a tryhard. First of all, nice one, Chris. Real gentlemanly term you got there. But also, I don't think that she wants to be validated so much as she's just trying to fuck tonight. So how do we do these, the Kyle way? Just put them down your throat and swallow. So basically the Kyle way is you down your throat and swallow. Yeah. So you're what, a hands-on teacher? This happens a bunch of times. A woman will very clearly be the one hitting on a guy, and the judges will just be like, fascinating technique he used there. Wow. One, game. two, three. <laughs> this is game. Yeah. At one point, Chris even makes a joke about it. Really? Yeah. Baby, thank you. I think she's the sexual aggressor in this situation. You know what I mean? Like, if anything, she should be receiving points for this pickup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as if. Am I right, guys? I think that part of the reason for this is because through the gamified lens that these guys view meeting women, they reduce them to an essentialized other. For them, women aren't people, but NPCs with a move set they can memorize. This brings me to another thing you see in this show and is pretty obvious when you dive into PUA culture, which is that these guys aren't actually that interested in finding a partner or even sex. I think you especially see this in the challenges where they have to lie. Like, Chris is honestly right when he asks, what are these guys gonna do now? In one episode, a guy gets a girl's number while pretending to be Russian and then promises to call her. As Eastern Europeans, we should hang out. What are we gonna do? We're gonna do exchange numbers and we'll, we'll party later. What's the telephone number? What the fuck is he possibly going to do with that number? That's already a fucked up thing to do, but imagine keeping that up while going on dates with someone. Do you wait until the third date before telling someone that you're not actually from Eastern Europe, or is that more of a conversation you have when you decide to be boyfriend and girlfriend? Actual murderer shit. But obviously, I doubt that he did that, or regularly pretends to be Russian. He was on a TV show. But him getting this woman's number to score points with the judges is kind of a perfect reflection of the way PUAs are motivated to pick up women not to find a partner or even just get laid, but for the approval of other men. We can see this in a paper by Daria Dayton called, <laughs> all these papers have amazing names, Man Bragging Online, Self-Praise on Pickup Artist Forms. In it, Dayton analyzes the speech patterns of the members on PUA message boards, I assume because she hates herself even more than I do. What she found, other than the bottom of a bottle, is that for these guys, the end goal of picking up girls is just so they can brag about it to their cool internet friends. Analyzing one post where a guy describes getting a date, Dayton writes, the author uses the woman's consent to meet him as evidence of a successful completion of an initiation routine, rather than for the sake of bragging about getting a date. Since flirtatious interactions are treated as training sessions with a number of objectives to be ticked off, not as a search for romantic happiness, getting a date in itself has no meaning to a pickup artist. First of all, absolutely bodied. You love to see it. But also though, as fucked up as that quote is, if I'm being honest, I can relate in some ways. Not to brag too much here, but I've dated a few people who are way hotter than me. I mean, that's not that high of a bar, I'm kind of just a gross little gremlin. But while this absolutely wasn't the reason I dated them, I will say that something I definitely enjoyed was the way that my friends would be impressed when they'd meet my girlfriend. I think in this aspect, Keys to the VIP kind of functions as a type of male fantasy. Not in the sense that the contestants pick up girls or get to party with models if they win. The fantasy is in using women as a way to demonstrate their status within masculinity, while these four supposed male archetypes watch and cheer for them. But here's the thing. Keys to the VIP isn't actually a show about pickup artists. At least, not intentionally. To understand why, let's take a quick intermission to talk about the history of seduction.
This video is long as fuck, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> The earliest European writings on seduction are in mythology, where the seducer is almost always a woman who uses her sexuality to manipulate a man. Calypso, Judith, Delilah, all PUAs. Lilith was an AFC and Sybil's a femcell. In Europe, this began to change with the fall of, like, warrior kings and the rise of aristocracies. As everyone got a bit more civilized and violence decreased, political power was no longer being exercised through strength, but through courtly cunning. That is, if you were a noble. Regular people were still pretty fucked. But as schemes and cunning became the main way to get and use power, being manipulative became seen as manly. Major win for boy bosses. That's right, ladies, men can be toxic too now. Now, this was all laid out in a paper titled By Means of Seduction, Pickup Artists and the Cultural History of Erotic Persuasion by Thorn R. Cray. In it, they talk about the changes in how seduction has been thought about throughout history. Uh, one thing they go into that doesn't really relate to anything, but I have to talk about it right now because it's amazing, is a story about Giacomo Casanova. Uh, unsurprisingly, that dude fucked. So there's this story about Casanova where one time he was hooking up with his friend's girlfriend, as you do, and eventually she tells him that the friend is into it and has been secretly watching them and like wants to keep doing that. And Casanova is just like, oh, that's a great idea! I mean, what kind of guy wouldn't want to watch his buddy laying pipe? <laughs> so then Casanova's just like, okay, here's the plan. You and I are gonna have sex, and we're gonna make it so hot that he has no choice but to come out of hiding, get on his knees, and beg to fuck you. And then you two will go off and have even hotter sex. Truly a dude's rock moment for the ages. Absolute Chad shit. But even if you weren't a freaky king like Casanova, seduction became a general thing in the 1600s originating in France. Coming out of courtly etiquette as well as the salons, those Pepe Le Pew motherfuckers developed methodical systems both for men and women detailing how to seduce someone. Some of these were published into books that actually read a lot like modern-day pickup tactics. One anonymously published book gives this advice. You, who in the struggle engages with a capricious woman, can model your mood after hers, give your mind the charms of frivolity, and affect a constant state of inconsistency. Something that's important, though, is that where this stuff differed from pickup artists today is that while seduction was developed as a way to manipulate the person you were attracted to, both people would be doing it and aware of what the other was doing. As Cray put it, seduction became less a battle and more of a game. Pickup artists today aren't doing that. A perfect example is negging, which is when a pickup artist gives their victim a backhanded compliment or says an accidental insult in order to lower their confidence so they'll want to seek the PUA's approval. And that's obviously gross as fuck, but something really interesting that Almog and Kaplan point out is that that is actually really close to how flirting works. When it's done right, flirting is all about saying something where it's not what you said, but what you were saying. The type of thing to get the person you're flirting with to start thinking things like, what did they mean by that? Do they like me? Do I like them? What you're doing is inviting them into a deeper level of communication, where the subtext is just as, if not more meaningful than the actual text of the conversation. When both people are doing it well, it's like a dance. but. That requires both people being on relatively equal footing. Negging, on the other hand, works in a similar way, but it relies on the pickup artist's target not being aware of what's happening, viewing the other person as a target rather than as a partner. Almog and Kaplan's paper picks up where Cray leaves off. They argue that what we call traditional masculinity came up and became the hegemonic or dominant form of masculinity during the industrial era. We're talking madmen shit here, the vision of the ideal man as a tough, competitive, unemotional breadwinner. But 
Coming into the post-industrial era, some new versions of masculinity came in to compete. One was what's sometimes called new masculinity, which is sort of what the soy boy stereotype evolved out of. Basically, men who cry, get in touch with their feelings, go to therapy, eat bugs, live in a pod, you get the idea. The other was metrosexuality. I see metrosexuality come up every once in a while as this joke about how in the 90s people thought that straight guys washing their asses was a whole new sexuality, and while, yes, that happened and is very funny, Almog and Kaplan point out that what metrosexuality actually was was defining masculinity purely through consumption habits, which I think is a really interesting point. I mean, I think that that is absolutely still a thing today, so maybe we can try and bring that term back, but like, as an insult. <laughs> Anyways, as Michael Kimmel writes in his very dramatically named book, Guyland, The Perilous World Where Boys Become Men, <laughs> with those three models of masculinity to choose from, young men in the early to late 2000s instead did a keg stand, puked off a fire escape, and made a booty call carving out a fourth version of masculinity that Almog and Kaplan call ladism. Basically, bro shit. Defined by stereotypical masculine signifiers like sports, beer, and bacon, hookups as a marker of social status, and a general disregard for responsibility, which, while traditional masculinity basically viewed women as domestic slaves, it did also actually involve a degree of responsibility to said slaves. In a sense, ladism's main departure from traditional masculinity was that it's all about enjoying all of the privileges of being a man without paying any of the costs that used to come with that. Coming back to Keys to the VIP, this is not a show about pickup artists. It's a show about lads. They're actually pretty explicit that they don't want guys who suck at getting laid on the show. Well, obviously, they are good entertainment. In one episode, Peaches gets pissed off at a contestant who sucks and straight up says that the show is not supposed to be for guys like that. Men, if you want to be on the show, make sure you have game. Because if you don't, you get embarrassed like this. This is unacceptable. <laughs> Check yourself, man. The kind of guys that they want are alpha males. Big, hot dudes with that golden retriever confidence. But... Pickup artists aren't lads, they're nerds. Nerd masculinity is interesting. It constitutes an alternative form of masculinity and one that's subjugated by the dominant one, ladism. I'm speaking in very broad generalizations right now, and it's worth noting that this is all a little bit dated now since nerd culture has come to be more and more mainstream, but nerdiness is stereotypically stigmatized. The classic nerd is an academic overachiever and social underachiever, often white, middle, or upper middle class, and very uncool, usually with interests and hobbies related to computers. And so, while they do enjoy plenty of the privileges of being men, within the male hierarchy, nerds don't do so well under ladism, where casual hookups determine social status. And so, they're left with three choices. They could accept their place at the bottom of the male social hierarchy. They could realize that all these hierarchies are bullshit, be they within or between genders, races, classes, or whatever, and then work to dismantle it in their own lives and in the world at large. Or they can find a way to the top of that hierarchy and be the boot. Which is where the seduction community comes in. The seduction community, both in their recruits and leaders, are primarily made up of nerds. Check out any pickup artist instructor, there is a 100% chance that they say that they used to be a loser who couldn't get a girl. I think a subtle but important part of their appeal is that they frame this problem as normal. Their name for guys who don't use their techniques is Average Frustrated Chumps, or AFCs, and the word average does a lot of work there. For one thing, by framing not being good at talking to women as normal, it makes these communities a lot more inviting, but also helps to condition the members to view manipulation as justifiable. Like, if almost all guys have the same problem, 
then maybe there's something wrong with women instead. Maybe there's something to this whole red pill thing after all. Once they're in, using some very bullshit evolutionary psychology, PUAs are taught that there's a simple, teachable system they can use to attract women. This is one of the most interesting things about these people to me. They are actually extremely aware in a lot of cases of the ways that gender is socially constructed. They understand that there's no inherent quality that makes a guy an alpha male. It's just a series of performances that can be mimicked, and that's what they do. All a pickup artist actually is, is a nerd in drag as an alpha male. I think that this is why Jordan Peterson will sometimes be portrayed as like an incel whisperer, able to get through to guys who've fallen into this stuff. But the reason he doesn't like them is because while they're more than happy to leave all other hierarchies that benefit them intact, pickup artists are trying to deconstruct the male dominance hierarchy, turning being an alpha male into a consumer identity a lot like metrosexuality was. To understand this, let's now compare Keys to the VIP to a different show that came out around the same time called The Pickup Artist. The Pickup Artist is a very dark show. It's hosted by Eric Von Markovic, who's much better known for his pickup artist alias, Mystery. I need you to understand that this guy is so cringe that it actually goes all the way back around and makes it hard to make fun of him. Like, here's what he looks like. Normally I'd make a joke about how he looks like if Chris Angel got a side gig selling merch at a Jamiroquai show, but that's actually what he's going for. How do you make fun of a guy who's trying to look like he got kicked out of the vampire club from the Matrix for being too much of a creep? How can you hurt the feelings of a man who dresses like he won his entire outfit at a Hot Topic themed amusement park? Mystery is one of the main characters in The Game by Neil Strauss, which for anyone who doesn't know, The Game isn't actually a guide to picking up women. It's a story about Strauss becoming a pickup artist, describing them as a bunch of sad losers. Strauss tells the tale of how he learned secret dating techniques, rose to fame and success in the PUA community, but how it slowly destroyed him, taught him instincts that made it impossible for him to properly communicate when he met a woman he was actually interested in forming a relationship with. I don't want to give Strauss too much credit here. The message of the book, in my opinion, is very much undercut by how much he glamorizes being a pickup artist in, like, a tortured rock star kind of way. It's like saying that the Wolf of Wall Street is against telemarketing, even though it also makes call centers look cool as hell. Also, two years after the game came out, Strauss realized that he could make a lot of money just by writing the book that everyone thought that the game was, and so in 2007 he released The Rules of the Game, which is just that. Also, I read most of the game while researching for this video, and I was not prepared for how much of being a pickup artist apparently involves close-up magic. <laughs> It makes sense, I guess, since Mystery used to be a magician, but the book will literally just be like, I approached a seven at the bar and immediately demonstrated high value by performing an oil and water card routine, followed by a simple color change. In the pickup artist, Mystery, accompanied by his two henchmen, J-Dog and Matador, teach eight nerds how to be pickup artists. Right off the bat, this show feels so different from Keys to the VIP. For one thing, in Keys to the VIP, there are a couple of times where, for the challenges, they'll get guys to cock block each other. Each player must retrieve a woman's phone number. What the player doesn't know is that his opponent will be sent in, determined to steal her away. Nice to meet you. Oh, you guys, I want to dance. I want to dance. Oh, you want to dance. In The Pickup Artist, that kind of happens a couple of times, and it is literally treated as the greatest violation possible. Anybody does that to me, I'll kick their ass. One of you got in the way of your wing, actually turned your back, sat next to him when he asked you to come join. I would never do that to a friend. And the most outrageous moment yet. I don't know what the f that was. I just crapped on Joe's set. I blew it out. What can you do? Also, mystery is just so weird. 
During each episode, he talks about what challenge the contestants are going to have to face. The students will be sent out into the field armed with nothing but their natural instincts. Each guy must select an attractive woman, then he must approach the woman in order to initiate a conversation. The lucky ones may even keep the woman engaged for a short time. Now, what do I expect to see from my students tonight? If history is any indicator, it'll be a total crash and burn. It's hard to describe, but there's something about that, right? Like, this isn't a cool alpha male. This is a weird nerd asking you obscure Star Wars trivia before letting you sit at his lunch table. Pickup artists are also a self-help community, and so you can see in the show how he seems to really genuinely care about the contestants in a way that feels completely at odds with the fact that he's teaching them to neg women. In one episode, during the elimination ceremony, he legit almost cries because he has to kick someone off. I'm just as good as anyone, and that's the biggest thing. Everyone cares so deeply for each and every one of us that are sitting here. Now you know how tough it is for me. Also, just one funny thing off the top is that any time in the show that they do, like, cutaway interviews, they put up unbelievably mean name cards. That you're like a brother to me and you're my friend so many times. I'm 26 years old. I'm 24 and I'm from Minnesota. I made it by the skin of my teeth, but I'm still here. Tara, that certainly didn't make me feel less nervous. But also, in the last episode, they changed them to be complimentary, which turns out to be so much more insulting. I just started gaming, and I was just locking in, I was using all the gam- The general arc of the season is watching the contestants transform from awkward nerds who, to be fair, probably spend a bit too much time in Xbox lobbies. I'd like to meet somebody of a moderately Jewish appearance. Nice skin, shapely brunette. Turning into the biggest scumbags alive. I don't think we would get along. I feel like we're too similar. We would fight all the time and I would win. Now, get number one on board. Go, uh, W's doing great right now. He's in lock in, compliance testing. Question. What have you got going for you? It's kind of heartbreaking. In the first episode, Mystery has the contestants try and fail to meet girls, and then tells them that they need to remake their entire identities. Right now, who you are today dies here. And then in the second episode, they all get makeovers as part of creating their drag personas. I mean, avatars. Each of you will build an avatar for yourselves. I'd like all of you to wear at least one interesting item in your avatar selection. I'd like to see accessories that convey sexuality. One contestant who's pretty funny is Fred. He's 45 and still a virgin, which isn't the funny part, like, no judgment. But what is very funny is at the beginning, Mystery asks all the guys what they're here to do, and Fred says that he's looking for a wife. I'd want to be like my father, who was married to the same woman for 51 years. You just want to make sure you marry the right woman. Exactly. And then Mystery tells him that this will definitely help him find a wife, even though for most episodes they go to like college bars, and so Fred is just wandering around saying stuff like this. I'm from New Orleans. So I, I'm from New Orleans. What are you doing, Katrina? King shit. Also, when they do the makeover, the look that Fred puts together looks exactly like the how do you do fellow kids meme. <laughs> also, just the way some of the scenes are presented is pretty rough. Like, there's an episode where one of the contestants has anxiety around being rejected. Uh, also, after he got rejected in the first episode, there's a scene where he talks about how he spent all night sharpieing his nails black. Do you color your nails black? Yeah, it is. That's awesome, man. I sharpied them. Just a precious boy. I love him so much. And then in the following episode, he's too scared to approach girls at the club, and it's presented in this way where it's like, damn, if he can't overcome this, he'll be alone forever. I'm like, I'm scared. I started thinking about what happened the first time I went into a club. So I kind of panicked. I just walked straight out. And it's like, 
I wish I could tell that guy that it's okay. Counterintuitive as it may seem, making women feel weird at a bar isn't actually a prerequisite for love and happiness. Hell, I couldn't really do that, and I do just fine in dating. There are girls who like the things that you like, I promise. But instead of that pep talk, he goes to talk to Mystery J-Dog and Matador, who give him what would be good enough motivational advice in any other context. What are you feeling right now, man? This feeling, you don't have to apologize for it. We all feel it. But you know what? I fail more times than I win in life. It's my ability to get up and keep going that allows me to eventually attain my goals. And then he goes back into the bar with his head held high and says something sleazy to a girl while motivational music plays. Hey, can I ask you ladies some questions? You said it would feel that good and it does. Son, we'll I'm afraid, right? So each episode has two challenges, one to win a reward, the other where the person who does the worst is eliminated. Why am I explaining this to you? You've seen a reality show before. Just picture Survivor, but without the intersectional feminism and respect for women that show is known for. They also get regular lessons from Mystery, who straight up just teaches them how to manipulate women. So we have several kiss tactics. First, we want to demonstrate higher value, and we want to simultaneously neg the target. If you're speaking and you accidentally brush against a person, you look at her funny. If you can get a solid Kino base here, that's all you get. You let go and it's tight. If it's not tight, if I notice it's a little loose, I can then say, all right, you're losing me. That's all it takes. That was an egg. <laughs> I can be nice to everybody except the target at first. Now that I've rolled off, she will feel the discomfort. It's as if she said or did something wrong to turn me off. She now will feel compelled at that moment to come chase me. So does this make sense? I've got this and this. Now she's comfortable. I can then lean in and smell her a lot closer than I will. Right? The contestants are all given scripts to study and perform, which they take very seriously. You need stories. You should have lots of stories going in order to systematically demonstrate that women are already in your life and that you have options. What we're trying to do is fake rapport with people you do not yet know. So from this point forward, all the material that you will convey will have DHV spike. Jealous girlfriend. So, well, I gotta go quickly, but one of my buddies. I can do the pieces individually, but getting the whole package together is a completely different matter. It's especially queer listening to Mystery. He's clearly just memorized probably hundreds of dialogue trees. While she's speaking, you can say, shh, you talk a lot. Would you like to kiss me? If she says no, you respond, I didn't say you could. And you could try it again a few minutes later. What if she says, maybe? You say, we'll find out. Come here. What if she says, I don't know? You'll say, let's find out. Come here. This is something that can be used in such a way that it protects you from ever getting rejected. And don't get me wrong here, Mystery is absolutely a bad dude, but you get a real sense here for how much this shit fucked him up too. Like, it's kind of ironic how they brag about manipulating women when, in order to do it, they've fully turned themselves into NPCs. Also, something that's worth addressing here, I think that it's pretty fair to say that at least a few of the contestants on this show are neurodivergent. And that is also true of a lot of the guys who get drawn in by pickup artists in the real world. Uh, so, I'm autistic and can definitely relate to not understanding social cues or not knowing how to read people. And so, as harmful and manipulative and unethical as this stuff is, I do absolutely understand the desire for a set of rules to explain social interactions, especially with dating, arguably the second most difficult social interaction there is right after making conversation with barbers. I don't know, maybe this will help someone or maybe it's an extremely toxic thing to do. I can't tell, but I do kind of gamify dating where when I'm on a date, I think of it as a game where it's a competition to see who can make the other person have more fun. It honestly works really well. Um, it might be a strange way to think of a social situation, but 
To make someone have fun, you actually have to acknowledge their humanity, a factor that gets lost in most PUA seduction mindsets. Hopefully that doesn't make me a piece of shit, but also, if anyone who's made it this far into the video doesn't want to be gross, but is tempted by the siren call of the dialogue tree's pickup artist's offer, try that instead. Um, but anyway, coming back to the show now, let's talk about the reward challenges real quick, because uh, they can be a bit kooky. They involve getting the guys to do stuff like having to wear speedos to a pool party to be more comfortable with their bodies, or practice kissing, or in one episode, one of the most fucked up things I have ever seen. So the contestants all show up to the challenge location, and Mystery explains that when they're talking to women, it's not what they say, but how they say it, which Okay, I guess. And then this happens. You will have a chance right now to speak to some women, and they are absolutely adorable. <laughs> Ladies? In a just society, everyone involved in the making of the show should be in prison. Mystery has them all compete to see who does the best job telling them the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, which, first of all, I never want to hear another fucking word about Drag Queen's story hour after this shit. Like, there are clips where they fully use pickup artist terminology to describe interacting with kids. In terms of my overall performance, I didn't really execute the, what Mystery intended me to execute. I opened the set, yes, but I failed to take control of it. And then, when they go to the club that night, they all talk about how they're going to use the lesson they learned at the school, which was apparently that talking to women is the same as talking to children. And guys, they're like little girls out there. Don't get run over this time. Also, with the challenges, while this show is unbelievably gross the entire time, in the first few episodes, I was at least relieved to see that they all took place in a bar or a club, you know? Like, these guys are garbage, but at least they're in an appropriate place to meet people. In the later episodes, that changes. In one episode, they go to a cafe, which Mystery describes as... A virtual female watering hole. It gets worse, though. In one of the last episodes, they have to learn to pick up what pickup artists call hired guns. Have you guys ever developed a crush on your favorite waitress at a restaurant? Because these working beauties are what we like to refer to as hired guns. Women who are hired for their beauty. I had to learn what that term meant for this video, and so now you do too. We're all worse now. In this episode, the challenge is to go to a strip club and pick up a stripper while she's on the clock. And Oh my god, the shit they do is so fucking gross, dude. If you can convey to her that you have already been with exotic dancers in the past, you are pre-selected. What are you going to convey? DHV spikes. They do respond just like other women. They respond to their emotions. So do you find this job fulfilling? Is this everything you ever wanted in your life? Is this, the, is this what you want for your life right now? Well, I mean, if you've never been a stripper before, I'm just joking. Of course I've never been a stripper. I mean, look at me, I'm freaking hot. <laughs> but, you know what? To be fair here, while the way that these guys acted is so gross, what kind of guy doesn't want to hit on a stripper, right? So, I decided to do a bit of research of my own and talk to an expert to learn the right way of doing that. So, um, hang on a second. Um, hello? Hey dude, um, could you like, uh, introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm Xander Corvus. I'm a, uh, 14 year porn veteran. I, uh, I'm a contract performer for Brazzers.com and, uh, yeah, streamer on, uh, on Twitch. Cool. So, what advice would you give to pickup artists trying to seduce a stripper while she's on the clock? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Good question. Yeah, it's always important to ask good questions. Um, I would say, you know, tip well, you know, because it's, you know, you want to show you got money. That's important. Uh, and then I would say, uh, you know, donate to a sex worker mutual aid fund, like the one in the description down below. Uh, that's really good. Uh, you know, sex workers love that kind of stuff. Um, and then next, I would stand up, you know, take a deep breath, like compose yourself. And just like a real Chad, walk yourself um, home um, because they're working and you're being a creepy fucking weirdo, is what I'd say. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for the advice. Uh, so, yeah, there you have it. Now, to end off, no disrespect to anyone who makes videos about the manosphere or whatever. Um, I think that they're good and helpful and fun to make and fun to watch. I mean, if you know anything about this channel, I am absolutely a fan of shooting fish in a barrel. But in a way, they're also very easy. Like, as a guy, it's easy to point to the Andrew Tates of the world and point out how they're dumb and wrong and bad and feel like one of the good ones. Like, I think that there's a thing with how people look at deviant behavior, where we like to look at the worst versions of it so that we don't have to think about how our own behavior might have some of the same characteristics. I think that part of the appeal of shows like Intervention is that it lets you look at a guy whose life has been ruined by meth and not have to think about how much you drink, because you're not like that guy. And I'm absolutely not going to be able to tell you how to date in a perfect, ethical, leftist way. This is a leftist video essay, we don't fix problems, we just name them. But if the broad goal of lefty dudes making this kind of content is to model a better version of how to be a guy, I think it would be helpful to acknowledge that we all have the potential to be the kind of sexist, manipulative guy we spend so much time dunking on. I was never what you would call red-pilled, but I've definitely been a fuckboy, a shitty partner, and caused harm. It feels so hollow and dishonest when the message for young, lonely men is just be a big, wholesome sweetie with no actual advice. I guess to me the problem is with, like, setting the bar at being better than Andrew Tate, right? Because, like... Yeah, but I'm pretty sure almost anyone watching this is better than Andrew Tate, because that guy's a fucking monster. Um, you know who's also better than Andrew Tate? Fucking nice guy Chris on Keys to the VIP. Chris, I am sure, is very nice to women when they're around and it suits him to be that way. But... He also clearly doesn't have a problem with being a massive scumbag, or with hanging out with guys who are open pieces of shit. You know, I'm sure that just about every guy watching this is a fellow nice, sweet boy who is much better than any of these, like, pickup artist monsters. But let's also try to be better than nice guy Chris. Thanks for watching.
everybody else When are you gonna take off your pants Like everybody else does everybody else Now that everyone's gone, I can tell you I don't love you, I like you Now that everyone's gone, I can tell you Honey, I am just like you Once again, this video was sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus an additional three months for free.